Hey, welcome back to Broker Talk. Uh, today's show is about building houses and or commercial projects in Maine. And I am lucky enough to have the president of Lewis and Mom Architecture, um, a great guy named Charlie Early, who has many, many, many years of experience. Uh, we share um, a, a property. He owned a property in Winter Harbor, Maine called the Donut Hall. And when I purchased it last year, I renamed it the Cottage on Henry's Cove. It's a beautiful property that was swept into the water with with the uh, uh, storms in January 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. A uh, horrible thing. But in the process of that, I've had the opportunity to meet Charlie. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Charlie. It's great to have you here. No, thank you very much for having me, Larry. New friends, here we are. Um, you love the property that I love, and uh, hearing why you sold it is why it was damaged. It wasn't tall enough, and it didn't withstand, you know, a storm surge. Um, but we're really talking about now is the rebuilding of this. And I'm in Massachusetts. I'm not in Maine. I'm not a Maine uh, um, resident, although I own property there. Um, the building process in Maine is very, very different than the process that I'm used to here, here in Massachusetts. One of the difference is, is um, the residential part. And I know you do both residential, mostly commercial, but you do residential as well. Um, talk to me about some of the differences that you know, because you've worked all over the world, um, in Maine versus anywhere else. Well, um, I can first say why we do commercial and residential. Um, commercial projects are larger and their economic curves are higher and lower. Residential are slower fire and they're more gentle in terms of their economic curve. So when you have a negative in a commercial market, if you have a soft thing going on above it, it helps even out the two types of work economically for our firm. Right. So we've, I learned that a long time ago from a boss in, in Switzerland who was also an economist. And, and uh, I've kept that practice going so that we always have something to do. <laughs> we're, also, we're very busy. Um, so, um, but there are big differences in the way things get done. Commercial in Maine is, of course, most of the time competitive bidding or someone has selected a general contractor to be a construction manager and they're on board from the beginning or to be a design builder. And we're hired in the first instance, we're hired by the owner and they're the construction manager, that triangle. And the other one, the other way is design build the owner hires the contractor and then the contractor hires us. So we answer to different paths depending on that constellation. Uh, our preference is design, bid, build, because that's when you design everything first and you build it second and you, you, you have drawing, complete drawings and complete specs before the contractor comes on board. Construction management, they come on board in the middle in design development. That's a good thing too, because they can contribute to the design, but they're not competitively bidding it. So in residential, it's a completely different ballgame. They don't, they don't, you don't see residential projects being competitively bid. You might have competitive uh, offers and, and interviews and do a direct negotiation with the one that you like. That could happen. But most of the time, the owners come with a builder, a friend, a family member, or somebody they know well and, and then worked with before have, have, have heard of and they've got a relationship going and they get on the radar with that builder and they decide I'm going to let Bob or Bill or Joe build my house and we start working with them and the builder is known to us and then we start doing the design work. So then it depends on what does that guy need? Um, some of those guys, some of those builders only need conceptual work and then they can run with it. Re residential work in Maine is not protected with the exception of um, what the local code enforcement officer would do if that project is in the shoreland protection zone like the donut hole is. Um, or, and they are always looking at the, the plumbing to make sure that the house is healthy. 
Um, but they, they, they rely on the state most of the time to do any electrical inspection. They don't have uh, the CEOs doing that locally. So it's a very different marketplace because residential design starts and it may not be executed for a year or two years, depending on the availability of the builder. So we say, what's the rush in designing it if you don't have that builder on board until then? You know, why would you rush the design process under that scenario? Um, and everybody wants whatever they asked for yesterday. <laughs> and sometimes it's not, it's not, it's not realistic or rational because you can design it all you want, but if you don't have somebody ready to build it, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to sit on it for a while and watch what the market's doing, you know, and that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother bucket of worms. Well, uh, having met you uh, through my caretaker, um, I, I, you introduced me to a fabulous builder, Dale Church, who uh, is incredibly well respected in town. And after, um, I believe the the first problem was January 9th. And on the 10th, on the 9th, I talked to Dale. On the 10th, Dale worked to get things put together in terms of because it's protected waters and we had to go into the water to pull the house out. Uh, he got all the permits and all of that in amazingly in 24 hours. And uh, we had a beautiful day the next day be, on a Friday before the second storm on a Saturday. And he pulled it out and he saved this house amazing guy. I wish I could continue to work with him um, uh, as we lift it and then have to put the piers back. But you had a, a really interesting knowledge about um, what the piers, what the pylons should be under this house and where they should sit. Because these were very, very short pylons that weren't actually even connected to the house. And, and so when the first wave hit it, house picked up when the wave went back, the house went down because the piers were gone. So um, now we have a different set of circumstances. But the question I was talking to you about is the 100-year floodplain and, and um, what this property really needs as it goes back together. And I'm thinking it has to be, what did you say? Uh, elevation has to be 15, and that's uh, where the beginning... Oh, okay. Well, we recently did work in Booth Bay Harbor in, on a waterfront um, property. We were hired by the Department of Marine Resources, a state entity. And we had to do floodplain research for them. And I did that with uh, one, of my, one of my consultants, John Kenny from Dubois and King. Um, and they're out of New Hampshire and Vermont. But he has, uh, I worked with him for years in Bangor, another firm. And he has started um, about three years ago, he started Dubois and King Bangor as a civil engineering firm. And we were friends many years ago and we are still friends today. And he's a smart guy with a PhD and we get along really well. So we've been working together, building our relationship um, on several projects. Anyway, Booth Bay, we, they had a coal bunker and they were talking about turning it into a residential dormitory for the science labs down there. And the, the floodplain down there is not as high as it is in Winter Harbor. It was elevation 11, I believe, was the floodplain level. Well, that put the whole ground, the whole bottom part of that building, a whole story underwater in that flood condition. And it, but the, the place was built, you know, 100 years ago or more. It was about the same age as the, as the donut hole. And and it, the FEMA law is that a residential property has to be the bottom of the structure, the bottom of the of the framing has to be one foot above the floodplain level that's established by FEMA. Well, FEMA established, remapped the Winter Harbor area, and that Henry Cove is elevation SE or VE, I can't remember, um, 15. But yeah, the, the, I think the, it's the, the letter does it. Yeah, the, 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 um, that uh, designation that's on it means um, tidal surge area. So it's not just a floodplain, it's a surge calculation. And Which is what that is a, out. It, so that's 15, and that's, that's the benchmark that you have to measure from. And before, 
all this happened, the, the, that building was at 11.6. Now, it's an existing building. It's been there since 1865, and, and, and that's where they built it. Back then, it was fine. And there's no, there's no obligation under those laws to lift it. But under your circumstances now, with your new ownership of it and the situation, when you put it back, you can't put it back at 11 foot six. You're just not allowed to. And, and uh, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna work within the constraints of the law. And so that puts your, you know, raises your property about five feet to, you know, from where it was in terms of its finished floor, because it's gonna be elevation 17 plus, plus or minus inches, depending on how strong, how thick the floor joists are. They're gonna be at least 12, so maybe they'd be 14. It depends on who designs the frame. So that, that's the rule on that, on that elevation stuff. And it's because it's, it's a kind of a, then it's a chicken and egg with the height of the building because it's kind of weird. You're thinking, well, if the, if the water is rising and global warming is real, <laughs> uh, they're, they're trying to preserve the coastline of Maine in that quaint view, but if the water is rising, everything else should rise too, including where you're measuring the height of the building, because you're getting into a pinch where FEMA is saying you got to go up, and somebody else is saying you got to stay at underneath a certain height from some point. Sometimes it's the mean of the site, sometimes it's the lowest point of the site. It depends on the local and the interpretation the CEO has, and what if the if the town has an ordinance or not. We're doing a hotel in Bar Harbor. They use the mean, which was very helpful to us to measure a site that's sloping. And we got a 260 foot long hotel building and we don't have to go to the very bottom. We went to the middle point and then we were able to measure and they do it again on the roof. They say the mean of the roof. So that's not the top of the roof. That's the midpoint of the slope of the roof. And that's how we got three living levels on that building with a ground floor the building steps down that hill and that's what the owner wanted and he was like telling us i want eight foot six ceilings and so you know we had to design a, a slender building not to get too far into detail but that's just we, we're looking at that all the time so the, that that information did not come directly from me i knew about it but i double checked it with john kenny um, because he's the professional that i would rely on and when John tells me this is the way the law reads, then I believe him. And um, so that's that's kind of that level thing. Elevation 15 is defined. Your that entire property is underwater yeah. at elevation 15, and then you have to be one foot higher than that, and you were, you know, significantly lower, three and a half feet lower before, and now you got to go one foot higher. And so it's it's that calculation is where this raising it. And you got this little quaint thing that won't look quaint anymore if you lift it like that. It's going to all of a sudden be boom up in the air. And if the town lets you do the height, then then what do you, what, what can we do architecturally to make it still feel like it's correct visually, you know, proportionately and that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, does that cover that topic? And the solution for that is. <laughs> In particular, you you would walk across the lawn and you would step into this cottage. Now that cottage has to be up, so we have to walk up steps. So of course we're going to build a deck on the front, and and that's that's an advantage too. People like decks. I love decks. Um, and and that's that the only way you can get a kind of a wharf or dock feeling without running uh, uh, opposite the shoreline protection, which won't allow you. To overhang anything, you can't go outside of the roof, right? Outline of the roof with a with a say a deck. Even though I have pictures where that that building had several large wharfs off of it, docks and things that went way out into the into that cove there in front of it, and and uh, you can still see in the in the ledge there are places where they chiseled out where the post sat. There's still hooks and things where they moored boats or or had 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 different connections and things and that's the you know that's another aspect of, you know if you had a a maritime use for that building if you were using it for anything maritime then you would have more leniency with with uh, what you could build in terms of wharf and dock right than, than 
You well, obviously you had a function that had something it, to do with both. To slide around rules, and, and uh, that's really not the kind of thing I want to do. But um, you know, if you had, um, uh, if we rented um, kayaks, you know, there, that's a maritime use. There isn't another kayak person right on that harbor like that. Maybe that would do it. But we're not going to do anything like that. We just want it to yeah. be, you know, um, what it is—a great place to come and and spend a vacation. Uh, for sure, it would have to be. Yeah, it would have to be full commercial use, and this would not be, and this would not be. Yeah. But let's talk yeah. about um, because I was um, confused. People were using piers, pylons, uh, and a number of different things. Talk about how you put a house that's in the water up. So uh, I've heard sauna tubes with concrete. I've heard wood that's strapped together. Um, is there a right way or is there uh, a more um, uh, safe way for right now with construction matters? Well, uh, concrete, if, it's, if you use concrete, you can do that, but you're gonna have to protect it because of the salt water. Concrete yeah. and salt are not friends. And over time, even some of the piers that were there started to show deterioration from the salt water. Now that water is actually brackish. It's mixed with fresh water because of that brook that's beside it. So I looked into that when I was thinking about ideas when I owned the place for 11 years about what could you do? And there are coatings out there and I you could, you could have precast piers made and you could make them out of sonal tube. It doesn't really matter how you make them. It's just a question of which, whether you want to cut them or, or cast them to the exact right size. But they would have to be protected if they're concrete. Um, granite has a little bit, uh, I think, more resistance to salt water. I'm not an expert in this field, but, but and there are ways to do that. But if you, if you seal something like that, you would probably have to be out there every three to five years at low tide resealing it to make sure that you're protected as you see the, the see it break down over time and mm -hmm. it would break down of course in that tidal area it would break down um i had actually gotten to the point where i looked around and kept looking around also down in booth bay and looking at traditional methods in maine um would be wood braced wood platforms like wharfs and docks and things yeah. um yeah. but um they're a pressure treated material they're subject to a, the same aggressive salt water thing and you might you would have maintenance on that as well um it would just look more traditional um and the 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 uh how you do it uh kind of depends on what you want to spend and how many piers you need piers or pylons it's the same basically the same nomenclature you can't drive piles there it's all ledge yeah so you're gonna you're on a rock the rock isn't hasn't moved that much in 100 years that you know that would cause an issue so uh, you you know you would building be building off of that and you would pin it to the rock and that kind of thing either way what you want is if you do it with wood you would want it to have the ability to breathe at low tide so you wouldn't take the wood all the way down to the ledge you would you would get a stainless steel pin and yoke to receive the wood that allow the bottom of the wood to breathe. So if it got wet, it can dry out again, like any tree in the forest, if they get wet and they, they dry out again. But if they can't dry out, that's when this rotting, rotting process begins. Um, so lots of ways to skin the cat, Larry. It just depends on you know what you want to spend. Uh, at one point I was looking at, at um, something I learned in Switzerland that they use up in the Alps for the, the barns that store hay and things like that. Um, and they have a problem with rodents and you have rodents there too. There's a lot of wildlife in, in Henry Co. And they put a, they put a flat granite disc on a pier and, and then the house post sits on that. And it's a complete gravity system. It does, there's not a lot of physical connection between the two. And that big disc is there to keep the rat can't go 
upside down. And so it keeps the, keeps the rats or the rodents out of the house. Sure. And, um, so there's, lots, there's all kinds of ideas, you know. Depends on what you want to, how much you want to spend, and and how you're then going to build a frame on top of all that. You I know? like every owner want to spend as little as possible and get as most for it. But um, we were talking earlier, right before the show, about design and and having plans and everything. And you made a very salient point about. Um, some people, some owners don't want to design anything, don't want to bring in an electrical engineer or any kind of an engineer to, to create plans. They just kind of want to wing it. And uh, that causes problems down the road. Um, oh, it does, think. for sure. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, and I think we talked about that before that, that on the phone, um, a, a contractor, you know, he can only put a price on something that you're telling him you want. He's not going to, in the, in, the, in the normal sense, he's not going to start, especially in the competitive sense, he's not going to try to do things that add money to his, make his price go up. He wants to get the job. That's the, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright said three rules to architecture. One, get the job. Two, get the job. Three, get the job. And the rest, let it happen. Um, so we believe in working with professionals. That's, that's what we do. Uh, we're also obligated to do certain things. If you want or need uh, uh, an architect stamp or an engineer stamp on a set of drawings, that stamp represents compliance with the law yeah. and the regulation. Yeah. We can't put that stamp on a drawing if we haven't followed the rules. Sure. And haven't obtained the, you know, the permits from the fire marshal or the local building permit is based on the fire marshal's permit. We don't do the local building permit that's typically done by the contractor based on a permit that fire marshal has said for commercial projects this yeah. is this is construction barrier free and um so that knowledge i really rely on a, a crack team of people that i manage my my career i have a degree in architecture from one of the finest design schools in the country virginia tech and um, I'm very proud of that architecture degree. It's a five-year program. And, but I was thrown in, immersed from the very beginning of my career over in Europe when I started as an apprentice. Thought I was going to stay for six months. I stayed for 20 years. But I was thrown into project management from day one. And I worked for a tyrant with a golden heart who taught me a lot. And I really appreciated Werner Kleiner, God rest his soul, for doing that. And he made me manage a project because I was the only one that spoke English. And we were working in, in Wafra in Kuwait, where the Gulf War entry point was. We were building this giant Swiss factory out there for resins and polyesters and things like that. And I started designing with him and managing at the same time. That was my, those, I had those two hats on. Well, now I wear about 14 hats. <laughs> but um, that's just the nature of my partnership with my in my business. I, and we're we're a small firm, and we're we're the same. I said the horsepower before. We're the same size, have the same capacity as a seventy man company would put on a project. We put the same amount of manpower to get things done. And one of the big advantages we have is when I ask my engineers that I've hired. You get something done by a certain time, they get it done. Yeah. If you go to a, a full A and E firm, just by nature, they're working on lots of different projects. So there's there's a competition in there for who's working on which project when. And sure. It's quite a scheduling thing. When you hire all these individual people, you can say, okay, if you want this job, I need you to do it by then. And they decide whether or not they can do it, and then they and they meet those deadlines. So there's a, there's I see an advantage in that in the way we structure things. You know, we don't do uh, gigantic commercial projects. I mean, right. this hotel is big. It's, this hotel we're doing is 40,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. It's a big building. It's a, it's a yeah. flagship. It's going to be the first hotel offering suites in Bar Harbor. The first. Oh. And Bar Harbor. It's owned by, yeah. Bar, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in Bar Harbor, but the, the owners are trying to pack everybody into hotel rooms. And this this owner lost the building to a fire. It was a, a dépendance, the 
It was just a sleeping park. It's, a, it's a, on a campus of mother house and pool house and this building burned and they lost 45 units and they came back with 21 suites. And uh, it's designed, it's a smart building. It's very, very, um, it's right in the middle. It's been closed in pretty much now. And, and uh, I mean, you can walk down the hall in that building to make the, the, the facilities guy. There's a problem in room 201. He can go down the hall and shut down room 201 at a, at a, a mechanical closet. He can, he can go in and turn just, just that suite off and nothing else in the hotel. No one else is inconvenienced by an issue. Um, That's planning. You know, there's things. Yeah, That's planning. Just, it was, it was, and, well, and they had a, they have a good facilities guy. It's been there 25 years and he's the one who said, Hey, I'd really like to be able to do that. Can I do that? And I said, absolutely. Let's make it easy. Let's make it so that it doesn't disturb the hotel guest. Right. You're dealing with one, but not all the hotel guests, but just one is inconvenienced because there's a leak in the bathroom or whatever's going on, an electrical problem or, you know, the exhaust fan isn't working or whatever. But it's, you know, and it's, it's streamlined. It's very streamlined. That type of building is highly repetitive. And so it's really, um, and we made it very flexible. In fact, that owner, without too much ado, could modify and say, I want some of these rooms to be individual rooms and take this 27 foot wide grid and cut it in half and make, make it an individual room without too much renovation work. Sure. That is physically possible because of the structure, the structural design, not to go into too much detail, moment framed where you need to be flexible. So there's nothing in your way. Yeah. There's no broth, no, no right. bracing and that kind right. of thing. All yeah. the bracing is, is in the other direction. Well, the interesting thing about this small cottage that, that's known as the Donut Hall um, is it's actually three buildings that were uh, cobbled together over the years. And so when it broke apart, those those things kind of twisted and came apart a little bit. So now we're forced and have the opportunity to create a single bottom on it and um, what are the best what's the best approach is that a concrete bottom is it is it wrapped in something what's the foundation that we're going to do well i mean it, once you get past the piers you know i would i would work with wood um above that to make that big frame but you're right it was and, and i the photographs i have from 1865 of that place it had the same cubic form that you saw today so that three I don't know how old, you know, the mother house is the big two story part versus the two shed parts that wrap around it in an L, but the sheds are extremely lightweight construction. They're not two by four. They're ripped down smaller than two by four. It's very lightweight construction. And, and uh, today you, you, you couldn't do that by code, you know, um, but it, it, it needs to be rescued all at once. If you can keep, yeah. you know, if you can imagine now it's a shell with a, with a failed floor, you need, you need to make that weakness a strength by having it be supported by one thing. And then those yeah. three things no longer are, have a, a sheer, a sheer line between them that sure. should cause it to twist or, or fail. So definitely what I would do wood, I would, you know, I would insulate it really well, um, waterproof it, you know, and that sort of thing, seal it. But I would get I would get it so that that insulated quality is because the air is moving underneath it. Of course, it's on stilts yes. or it's on piers up in the air. So in winter, if you're going to use it all year round, which it has never been used year round, um, but if you're going to do that, you need to make to think about that. You need to think about its you know its plumbing and its water connection to the land and how that is going to work. How flexible that needs to be or how accessible or how protected or how insulated, how you're going to deal with um, the winter cold, cold freezing, because there's a, you know, a 12 or 14 foot section of that that has to be somehow protected before it gets underground far enough. And you can only go down to the ledge, which is not, you know, it's, it's two and a half to three feet down in that little postage stamp yard to the ledge. It's very shallow. Yeah. So, You've got to you've got to insulate it. You've got to protect it so that so that it can make it through main winters because yeah. it, it's cold. It's cold we, up here. 
Yeah, we we put a driveway in this year and we hit ledge pretty much a couple of inches in. So um, that was that was a little bit difficult. But um, yeah, the stone for the driveway went on the ledge. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 So, you know, when I bought it, I did it years ago, years and years ago, I put a water line diagonally. There's a water line that runs across um, the property to get to the source of water at, out at the street. And we had, you know, th there's rules of insulation. You know, you, every, t I think it's every inch is worth a foot, I believe. So you have to calculate out, okay, how, how deep am I? How much insulation do I have to put on top of this to protect it from the frost? Frost is a real issue in Maine. Frost heave, I'm sure you've heard of that before. And this is just to keep things flowing. Um, but, you know, it was, it, we, it, was, it was always treated like a trailer in, in winter. You stripped it, you emptied it, you purged it, and you put antifreeze in everything to keep it from uh, having problems. Because in, in, during winter when I owned it, um, Billy would take care of that kind of stuff for us. And, you know, the caretaker. Uh, yeah. The caretaker would, 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 would do that. And it's, it's set up to do that, make it easy to purge. Um, but um, and it, was a, it was a gravity fed system. So it was pretty easy to open it up and let it, let it all run out. And then, then we'd close it and put the, put the antifreeze in as an extra measure. Yeah. Um, so um, that's the way we always treated it. I just think it's it's interesting. There there are so many aspects in building and architecture and structure and and there it's it's very disparate. But all of the really good people um, that I've ever worked with in my career often are have a hobby that feeds another part of their brain. And I know that you're you're a singer songwriter. So um, how much time do you devote to that part of your life? I, I wish I could devote more. <laughs> um, I, I have a band and tonight we, we rehearsed tonight. The band is called Rivertown and we're all guys, you know, that, that are in our, in our late fifties and sixties and seventies, you know, it's an older group of guys, but we all have a, a, a lifetime of making music. And so it's a, it's a whole lot of fun. We can get quite seriously in terms of arrangements and quality. And we're always sure. working on new material. We, we, we do write our own music. We play covers. We give the people what they want. We give them obscure covers. They might think that's unoriginal by accident, you know, so they don't know that particular song. Um, but uh, I wish I was half the songwriter that my son is. Uh, Martin is, is uh, in my opinion, I mean, I'm biased, but he's a great songwriter. And he's, he tours nationwide with the Ballroom Thieves. And he's known in Boston very, very well. He's won several Boston Music Awards. And, and uh, he left yesterday for a month out on the road as a, a warm-up act yeah. to a, 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 a higher-tiered. Yeah. You, you but anyway, have, anyway. You have to get there, too. I've always... Music, you know, when I was in college or even before that, mainly in college is when I started picking up guitar and I started writing songs and I started performing. I'd been singing in church choirs all my life. And, and, and my dad was always saying, my dad was very pragmatic and very, very serious guy, very strict. And he said, well, you know, that's a good avocation. You know, I wouldn't let him say hobby. Um, <laughs> but uh, I said, dad, I don't have to. He was saying, you have to choose between architecture and music. You're going to have to choose. And I said, I said, Dad, they're the same thing. Really? Yes. It's the same level of risk in architecture that it is in music. They're both hard professions. And, and I said, you know, they say that, you know, uh, architecture is frozen music and music is, is, is thought out architecture. Um, it's, it's sort of a, a thing that I think it keeps me sane yeah. to be able to shut down. And just turn it off and say, now I'm going to go right. play and sing right. and really enjoy it. You know, so thank you for asking about that. We enjoy well, enjoy music very much. Uh, you made a point about the age, and I've just got to tell you, the Rolling Stones are in their 80s. So <laughs> there is life after your 60s and 70s in music. Yeah, and they're they're a little bit more successful than we are. <laughs> they, they hey, if you're having a we're not. 
if you're having a good time and your audience is having a good time, who cares? Um, yeah, we're not, we're not, it's not, we're not quitting our day jobs and some of us are actually retired. So don't have a day job to quit, but, but um, we all have a, you know, it's, it's fun when you have a camaraderie and a kind of, I would call it a family type thing. Our rehearsals are one set full blown, like we're performing. Then we sit down and we have a meal. One of us caters a meal. I'm bringing a big goulash tonight that my wife helped me make. And then we have another set. And so there's this hour in between where we eat together and talk yeah. together about whatever yeah. is going on in our worlds. And so that really kind of brings us together in, at another level as humans. Exactly. Uh, beyond, the, beyond the musical chemistry, which is quite fascinating um, yeah. when you can make music with people. Some people you can make music with and some people just it just doesn't click and you just you yeah. can't get on the same on the same yeah. set of rails, you know. That's true. So. And you can make music with somebody for a good while and then all, all of a sudden for some reason you can't and everybody moves on. So um but that's that's what, a, that's what can happen. Yeah. So um I want to share with my audience if you have any kind of a residential or commercial project, you should definitely be in touch with Charlie Early from Lewis and Mom Architecture. Where where is that? Where is your office? Your physical office? Well, um our physical, our primary office, we've been in Bucksport, Maine since 1983. And we're at 119 Main Street, Suite C, in Bucksport, Maine, uh, 04416 is the zip code. Um, our phone number is 207-469-7440. That phone actually, ever since COVID, connects to this room, which is in Winterport. So that we actually ended up with a with a Winterport branch office. My business partner, Jim Tackenhorst, who is our licensed architect, is over in Bucksport. And I'm here in Winterport. And I got so comfortable working from home and being able to to not stop at five and drive home. I have to I sometimes work into the evening when I need to and that kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, and 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 uh so we said, well, okay, well, let's, have, let's just have a branch office and it works. We just, we use Zoom and that kind of thing. And so we've got two, two locations. One is an official presence and the other is just an, by necessity, this, this Winterport branch. Well, I, so I can I, be reached. Let me give my cell phone number is 207-659-6683. Do it before midnight tonight. Charlie is standing by. <laughs> or, maybe, or maybe not. You've got a practice tonight. <laughs> well, and it's never, and you know, and it's inevitable right now. Everyone in the state of Maine is busy. All of the contractors are understaffed. They cannot find the labor force to do the work. Yeah. Uh, add all the supply chain delays and material availability things to it, to the mix, and the the, the market has changed a lot yeah. in the last three years for everyone all over the country. So. Yeah. Yeah, we're an extremity market, which which explains, you know, in in brief, that is, in, in my mind explains the difference between a lot of the places in America where the construction industry is different than yeah. it is here. Um, yeah, we're we're well, a big we're a big small town. That's what we are. Maine's a big small town. I just feel blessed to have met you and have this connection with this wonderful property in Maine, and if, and um, have benefited from learning at your knee. And I, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Charlie Early, for uh, for being a guest here at Broker Talk. And if you like what you hear, you can um, subscribe. You can do that ding thing. Um, next week, we'll have another great guest. Thank you again, Charlie Early, for being, uh, being our guest today. No problem, Larry. And in 